Italy's contributions to the genre are certainly well acknowledged and praised, but there are also their share of detractors. Compositional excess, too much style, not enough substance, and a share banality perhaps. I of course disagree with these sentiments. I love Italian horror as many of you do. And a couple years ago I did a uh, overlooked underrated Italian show which did really well. You guys seem to really like it. So here it is two years, uh, maybe two, three years later, the sequel. Some more underrated and overlooked Italian horror. Welcome back to the ball everybody. Welcome back everybody, it's great to see you. I know it's been a really long time uh, in this rather trying year. I wanted to get something in here. I really wanted to do this in conjunction with uh, Moods, 22 Shots of Moods. Um, he did a Italian Horror Month uh, last month and I wanted to do that. Just didn't have the time to, to get one in. But I figured one of my, I guess, most, uh, get a lot of comments about it and a lot of views on that one particular episode. Probably of all the episodes I've done over the years, Besides like the ones with like the sketches, the comedic sketches and stuff, which I, of course, very much miss doing. Um, one of my most popular ones was my um, underrated Overlooked Italian episode. I think I did 20 to 30 films. Um, and I'm, I won't guarantee it, but I'm pretty sure that this batch of films that I'm doing today, I don't think I have any... I didn't go back and watch the episode, unfortunately, but I don't think any of these were within that show. Sure you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure these are. I have 13 titles here. I figure that's a good horror number. Um, and I have to make the distinction here that these are all um, titles that are available in physical format. No bootlegs. It's uh, tempting not to do that because there's so many um, great Italian horror films that have yet to see a release, unfortunately. Um, and I have a lot of bootlegs um, on DVD, which many of which have pretty solid transfers. So I was thinking about including those, but then I figure it's just even more difficult to seek them out. So all these ones that I have here today, if you are collectors of physical media, um, you can't find these. Some easier than others to find, but they are available in, in various uh, regions to pick up for your collection. Or, of course, you can uh, try streaming, streaming them if that's your thing. But I, of course, love all 13 of these films um, and, of course, highly recommend them, which is why I'm doing this. Um, but first, a couple other things uh, since it's been a while. I did start my podcast um, called Cannibal Holocast. I hope that you guys have checked it out. Give it a listen. I hope that you guys enjoy it. Um, if you do, please share. It is available on, of course, here on the Horseball YouTube channel, but also um, Apple Podcasts and Spotify. So please share. Let your friends know. Anyone you know who loves podcasts, crank it up in your car, on the way to work, whatever. I've only done a few episodes, but I'm um, working on my next one, which should be a pretty big doozy. But I've been, I've really enjoyed it. I've really enjoyed the process. It's such a different, um, different animal than doing this. Um, I love the the stages to it, um, the writing process, and then the research, and then the actual recording and the editing. So I love the 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 incremental um, development of it. I think it's really cool and a little bit different for me. Um, so yeah, so thank you for. All of you out there who have listened and, and shared and commented, I appreciate that. Um, and also, another big announcement here. It is that time of year again. One thing I will never stop doing, knock on wood, is the Golden Horn Awards. Despite all the the craziness of, of, of this year, um, luckily the, the genre wasn't affected too much by it. I think it's been yet another great year. Um, and uh, this is the 10th Hornies, guys. Really proud of that. And i um, really excited for this one. We're doing a few different things, a few different surprises for you guys. Being the 10th one, the 10th anniversary. The biggest thing, though, it is going to be live, and I mean that. <laughs> it's actually going to be a, a live stream on YouTube. So it will be uh, Saturday, January 2nd, 8 o'clock, YouTube live stream. Um, you'll be there. You can you can actually be kind of interactive for the first time. You can comment and 
you know, we'll do our best to interact with you while we're while we're spilling out the awards. And we're Finch and I are really excited for this. Um, a lot of great films this year, and I think this will be a lot different um, doing it that way. And I think it's special and it'll be a lot of fun. So I hope you join us. Of course, if you're unable to make it live, it will be there um, on the channel for you to watch at your convenience. All right, so let's get to this list. Um, when it comes to Italian horror, I think you guys, if you watch the show, you know I adore it, as a lot of you do. If you're new to the show, um, it's definitely one of my favorite, I don't call it a subgenre, but my favorite regional areas for in the world and their contributions to horror. Very vast, of course, um, being the most prolific throughout, you know, from the 60s to the mid to late 80s, is probably the end of its heyday, really. Um, I did include one modern film. Luckily, there are still, of course, not to the level of a uh, level that it used to be, but there are still contributors to it, uh, Italian filmmakers. Um, so I did include a modern one in this list, which I still feel doesn't get enough credit. And definitely a film that was uh, part of my award show several years back. Um, but yeah, the set vastness of, of their contributions just make it all the more. Um, fertile for having so many titles that have yet to be seen by a lot of people as i said so many films still yet to be released hopefully the labels i touched on this on my last podcast um like vinegar syndrome and severin and stuff like that will continue to release these italian films but there's still so many of them and even these titles that i have here today not all of them are blu-ray um so a lot of these could even definitely deserve upgrades absolutely um and i think a, a similarity of all of these these films that you'll see here um, that kind of ties them together and kind of exposes what I love, the element that I love of my favorite, particularly my favorite Italian horror films. Um, and that's having, if you were to make one today, if you were a young Italian filmmaker, and it's these, these traits of, um, and they kind of go hand in hand with each other to create the biggest uh, component to me for having a successful Italian horror film. That's um, great cinematography, which of course, you know, a template laid down by Mario Bava, um, a great score. So many composers, as we know, contributed so many amazing scores. Um, and the locations, especially these films, you'll you'll see the similarity when I go through them. Authentic locations, um, your crypts, your castles, your this architecture and all that stuff. Um, kind of unique to the area of where they shot in Europe, and um, all those. All those things kind of tie together to create my favorite aspect of at least my favorite Italian horror films. That's atmosphere. All those things contribute to that. And all those things are really the caveat to, to me having a successful Italian horror film or Italian horror homage, which we've, of course, seen over the last few years, uh, particularly by French filmmakers that have, uh, have made an homage to Italian horror films and, I think, have used those elements to great effect and is why they're successful. Let's get to it. I got, I got 13 films. I do have a drink here in normal fashion. Um, this is Zombie Dust from Three Floyds. Used to be one of my favorite beers. Not the beer that it used to be, unfortunately, now that you can actually get get it pretty easy around here. Um, ironically, it's not as good as it used to be when it was hard to find, but um, salute. These are not in any order. I didn't do like, you know, the best underrated to the, you know, I just didn't bother with that because it's kind of like, I think they're pretty interchangeable. Sure, there are some of these films I like to varying degrees more than the others, um, but I love every single one of them, of course. I obviously want you to see them if you haven't and or own them. Satan's Wife. Um, this is by Pierre Carpi. I'm going to butcher these names, of course. This is the... Uh, the great label, the mark of quality of cheesy flicks. That's sarcasm, of course. But I got a hand at them. Yeah, they don't they don't remaster anything. Um, but you know what? They they release films physically that no other no other label does. Um, they put nice artwork on it. So I mean, I got to give them credit. This one definitely probably V I'd call it VHS quality, but certainly worth picking up again. Like I'll say, as a broken record as this this goes on, um, so many of these films deserve an upgrade. This would be really high on the list, just as far as the quality, uh, lacking quality. Um, super cool. One of these on, um, like, I guess, evil child films, I would call it that. Um, she's kind of like, I, don't, I forget the actress's name. I think it's Valentina Cort 
Taze E. Um, she's in, uh, you'll recognize her from several other um, great Italian horror films, uh, Ghost House, probably most notably for Argento's uh, Tenebrae. She's the one that get chased by the dog. Um, so she's the lead in this. A really cool seeing her in, a, in the major role, really, of the film. She's the, the young the young girl who's kind of like the chosen one. And it's, and it's an Italian foray into the um, satanic panic subgenre, which I think a lot of us love, which was done best, of course, during the 70s. Great score. I'm bad. I don't remember who did the score for this film. It is available on vinyl. I need to pick it up. So a fantastic, memorable score. Um, again, great at atmosphere. They're all going to have these tra traits that I mentioned earlier, which is why I love them. But yeah, if you're into the the atmospheric, satanic, um, dealing with a, a child, uh, it's better than some of the other uh, films of that ilk within the Italian genre that maybe came across as a bit cheesy at times. Um, I would say Marabava's Shock was the best one at dealing with that, for sure. But this one was really damn good. It's not cheesy and um, definitely worth picking up. And charge the cheesy flicks for being the only label to give this something at least. This is a film, Virgin and Nuremberg, that despite some of the horror credentials and, and that it has in it, including having Christopher Lee play a fairly big role in it, I just don't get anyone hear anyone talk about this film. Um, this is a pretty solid release by a Shriek Show. Um, you guys remember them? Cool label back in the day, and uh, definitely this would fall under a lot of these. Do um, is and that's probably the most neglected subgenre within Italian horror is the Gothic horror, which I love. Um, that's where you really see those amazing locations with the the castles, the crypts, the um, all those things, um, cemeteries, and you know your your candelabras and your white night gowns and wind and fog, all that stuff that I just love and that creates so much atmosphere. And this is definitely one of those films. Great location in a castle. There's one particularly great scene of one of the actresses is walking um, outside. She hears something, so she's kind of she knows something's kind of after her. So she she leaves and she's walking outside and there's um there's a row of trees and there's some red lighting um, on the trees and on her as well. And it's just a great great scene and that's what a lot of these films have are these memorable scenes not just the the, the music that makes you remember but it's these, the cinematography the actors um and just the atmosphere that it creates and the feelings that it elicits to the viewer and this one has a bunch of them there's there is a, a really funny cheesy part towards the un, end of the film unintentionally cheesy but i love seeing these because uh probably made most famous within i guess european or call horror cinema would be the tombs of the blind dead uh, franchise when they I think it was the third film I think when they used like the models and it looked like a boat was like in a bathtub there's kind of a similar scene in here where there's like one of the actors is caught um, in like a crypt and water is beginning to fill it up and uh, so it's like flooding and they show some rocks and stuff being flooded by by uh, you know a mass of water and it is clearly a um, Clearly a model and not a very good one at that, but nonetheless add some charms to the... I would still take that over CGI any day. Anyway, super cool. Uh, Christopher Lee's, um, as always, awesome. And there's an awesome, this, I guess you call him the lead creature here. Really cool makeup. Uh, super cool film. And this is by uh, um, Antonio Margariti. So it's kind of it's kind of weird that he, of course, is a very well-known well-known Italian filmmaker, um, a lot of contributions from him, and it's kind of weird that this, to me, is, is grossly overlooked. Um, Riz Ortolani, he did one of my favorite scores, Cannibal Holocaust. Uh, he did the score for this, so awesome. It's got, it checks all the boxes for the, for the gothic horror. Another label, Retro Media, put this out. This film's been on plenty of uh, like compilation releases. And I'm sure some of you out there might say, you know, how can you consider a Barbara Steele film as overlooked or underrated? I really think this is. Um, I mean, she's she had such a prolific career, of course, in my opinion. Like, everything she was involved with, whether it be in the leading role earlier in her career and then some of the, like, secondary appearances um, that she made later in her career. I think every horror film she was involved with was good or great. And uh, this film... One of my favorites, and again, this is a film that really deserves a Blu-ray. I still wish that somebody would give her a box set. I'd probably comment on 
like Severin or some other labels, social media, probably a couple times a year, saying give her a box set, include um, um, Horrible Dr. Hitchcock, which I think is a film I included on my last video of this, um, whenever that was, a couple years ago. Um, but yeah, this is similar in story, though it feels very gothic, period piece, um, and it's kind of one of those ones where, and she's done this a couple times in films where she does it so well, her and a love interest are conniving against her husband. In this case, her husband is a is a successful but perhaps a bit mad doctor. Um, similar similar in setup to um, horrible Doctor Hitchcock. Um, but this one focuses more so. In that one, she was more of the um, you know you cared about her character. She was the victim in that film, as opposed to here she's conniving with her her love interest um, against her husband. I don't want to give too much away because it just so well acted, she's great, carries the film as always, um, well written, and it has like a lot of these gothic horror films, especially with the Italians, I love the final act, it wraps up nicely, and uh, the, the endings to these like gothic thrillers always uh, bring a smile to my face, because they always wrap up so, so well, and they're not, they differ from like the hammer gothic horror films, I don't want to put those down, but a lot of those, the endings are very similar, they kind of like, there's a there's a finality to him where the the good wins all the time, it seems, or uh, Peter Cushing will come to the rescue. You know, there's kind of like this a very uh, a structured, somewhat predictable ending to a lot of those films, as much as I love them. But in Italy, you, you don't always really know how it's going to end up. It doesn't always end up well, and of course that is always great. There's, of course, oftentimes a twist. Great film, The Ghost. We'd love to see an upgrade. But for now, this is actually, the transfer is really nice, and... Uh, Pretty sure you can pick this up still, and I like this cover with lovely Barbara on it. Check it out. Watch me when I kill a giallo. Um, admittedly, I would say this has a nice following, and I certainly see other people talk about this film, but still, I consider this an underrated giallo that deserves more credit, because I think it's, it's one of the best, honestly, in my opinion, and it checks all those boxes from a giallo perspective. Um, I love this story, and it's actually one of the more... I would say darker giallos, and there's certainly some dark ones out there. Um, but I think the final act, I don't want to give it away if you haven't seen it, but the final act is pretty dark and pretty grim and downbeat, which is really cool. I really liked the, I like the theme that it hit towards the end. I don't want to get it. It, is, it does cover themes. Um, it's not the main part of it, but as it, the story develops um, and the story comes out, it's, it's, it's on themes of, of Nazi, you know, Nazi Germany and stuff. Um, so it's cool how that develops. I really like how they did it. Great score. I love the score of this film. Um, it's a couple. There's like a main theme to the to the film, um, which is really somber and beautiful. And then, but then you have some really atmospheric, creepy elements to the score, which is really cool. The kills are great, stylish. Um, the the score itself. I forget. Who, it's a group that did the score, and it's certainly they've probably been accused of of ripping off Goblin. It definitely sounds a lot like. Uh, kind of like a goblin best of. I'm fine with that. It's fantastic. Um, if you're going to emulate someone, emulate the best. And I uh, yeah, love the score. The kills are stylish. Um, yeah, it, it's fantastic. I love the, the, the cast. I'm um, the lead guy, detective, who's looking into the killings. Um, he's great. He's kind of has like this... He's kind of kind of has like macho um, detective guy, but he also has like a vulnerability vulnerability to him, which I think is really cool. Um, I love this film so much. I watch it probably a couple times a year. And uh, this is a great edition by 88 Films, but there's been plenty of other editions of this film. Probably one of the most talked about films of this, this stack here, but I still still think it's, it's underrated. I think it's one of the best Gialli. Speaking of which, another great Gialli, and one of my absolute favorites. Again, I think this gets some credit, but I don't think it's... You know, when you see people do their lists of, like, top ten best Giallo films and stuff, I think this deserves to be on there. Um, Luigi Bazzoni did this film. His other films are, are good as well, so check them out. And, of course, uh, Franco Nero, awesome as always. Love him so much. I'm sure most of you do. He's uh, so well written. Um, so the narrative is great. Um, and this is, one of I think, one of the best-looking Giallos. There's some... Sorry, Jolly. There's some uh, great cinematography in this film. Set pieces, setups, lighting. Um, there's a particularly one of my probably one of my all-time individual favorite scenes in a Giallo is um, 
it's not really a spoiler, but it's later in the film, and uh, it's it's really suspenseful. It's a child, um, he's home, a young boy, he's home alone in, in this, you know, kind of very, I don't call it a mansion, but a very, very nice home, very uh, trendy looking artistic home. Um, and uh, he's, his mother calls him and tells him that she'll, she's like away or something, I don't know why he's, I think, I don't know why he's home alone. I think they've referenced that, like, the babysitter left or something. I don't remember. Anyway, he's trying to go to sleep, but she just calls home that her flight's running late, and she just tells him to, to lock the doors, and there's kind of this elaborate um, scene where he, the house has, like, these windows where you have to, like, manually click a button, and these massive, like, floor-to-ceiling windows, shades come down and lock so it's and it's night so there's like lights coming from outside it's so it's so well lit and you know that something's you know someone's there you know you've seen enough films to know that he's the boy's not alone and the mother's concerned and he goes through and slowly you know they show him tracking shot of, of locking all the windows and all the doors he comes back to the phone and then he says to his mom it's good and then like the lights all the lights go out and power goes out and uh the rest of that scene is is the killer going after the boy and so well constructed and executed love that scene so much and that's kind of a good um example of the film in general it's so well done franco nero's great as always i think this film has a couple twists in it and, and one of those examples of the of gialli where there's like multiple twists and uh so good great score love this film so much and another film like watch me when i kill that i probably watch a couple times every year Another one, surprisingly, with Christopher Lean, we have a couple, two or three here in this, this stack that I don't hear people talk about. And you think with his, with his uh, reputation and all the films that he's been involved with, um, I just it shocks me. And I was, uh, I'm aware that it, you know there's there's you have to deal with rights and all that stuff. You know, I, I I'm aware you don't just release it, but I'm hoping somewhere, someday, someone is is trying to get this uh, 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 upgrade. Um, for now, though, this is really nice. This is a UK release, Castle of the Living Dead. It also has an early role from um, Donald Sutherland, which is cool seeing him. But this is it's a really fun film. Cool thing is you have uh, it's period piece, medieval times. You have a great castle, and you have a really fun cast. Of basically, a group goes to this castle. Of course, Christopher Lee is the count. It's not a vampire film, but per se, but it, it's you know classic vintage Christopher Lee, the head of the castle, invites this this group in. Um, they're actually kind of like Carney's kind of it's such a cool cast of characters. Um, you have a you have a midget, you have like kind of like a Joker um, comedy comedic guy. Um, it's just it's like a cast of misfits. You you got the beautiful woman, but it's it's a really likable crew of characters that you're rooting for going up against essentially Christopher Lee in this castle and trying to escape alive. So there's some humor, so it's well written, there's some humor involved. Of course, as I said, great atmosphere. There's a great scene where Christopher Lee first comes out and there's this large room and there's all this taxidermy on the wall. This is a black and white film, by the way. Um, taxidermy on the wall and they zoom in on like, you know, the faces of the taxidermy. Just a great scene as he walks in. He's got some like black makeup underneath his eyes. It looks great, of course, in black and white. So this film would really, really serve well with a, with a Blu-ray upgrade with the cinematography. And I love how black and white films look, even when they're not, you know, very uh, remastered or anything. But they look even cooler, of course, when they are. So Castle of the Living Dead, super cool medieval times type horror film, um, most of which takes place in a castle um, with Christopher Lee. How can you not love that? You'll see a few films that I have here that were um, released by um, Camera Obscure, which I believe, I'm pretty sure this is an Italian label. And uh, these are still, I mean, you can get them. All, some of the films that they put out are on DVD, and then some of them, they also, they upgraded them to Blu-ray. Um, but I'm pretty sure they're not like, easy to find, but yeah, a lot of them are still on eBay. I'm, I don't believe that the site um, the website is still running by the company. I could be wrong. I haven't checked in a while, but uh, they put out a bunch of great Italian and definitely more obscure Italian titles. Even the DVDs look great. Um, they're kind of show this really quick. They look kind of like a digipack style, and they give you a booklet. So they all look like this again. Some are on DVD, some are on Blu-ray. 
and I have a few here in this list. This one, Spirit of Death, Spirits of Death. Again, I'm gonna say it, it's a broken record, I know, redundant here, but very well written, and it's got the, the narrative is just very, so well done, and a lot of that has to do with this. I mean, you have these cast of characters, you're gonna see some of these, um, you're gonna recognize a lot of these actors, Luigi Pastilli, um, I forget a lot of the, the, their names, uh, Ida Galli, Ivan Rasimov, um, yeah, a lot of, some of these people are, are in multiple of these films, you're, you'll recognize them, of course. So the, the casts are great, and uh, they're great for a reason, they're good actors, I think they're actually underrated, I would say, probably, generally speaking. Um, I think that's an element of a town horror that I think didn't get enough credit. I mean, you have, you have your, you know, your cheesy kind of 80s stuff, like the Bruno Mattai stuff, the rip-off stuff, maybe later, Lindsay, that type of stuff. That's such a small element of Italian horror. I think majority of Italian horror and why I liked so much is the acting, the acting and writing actually was fantastic. And uh, in a lot of cases, like some of these kind of like layered, elaborate giallos, gialli, um, you almost see there's a panache to them and you see that in the acting. I, to me, I feel like I can f see the actors are really enjoying the role. At least that's what I is conveyed to me. That's what I pick up on. Sometimes you'll watch a film and you just, you know, the, the actor's embarrassed to be involved. I never get that in, in a lot of these, like, 70s, you know, obscure Italian films with a lot of these, again, a lot of these same cast members. This is one they're all kind of a car, kind of old trope of a car breaks down. A group of affluent um, friends end up at, I forget the one actor's name. I'm going to, you'll recognize him when you see, if you see this film. I forget, he's in a lot of great films. Um, he invites them in. There, here's his friends, and they end up having, like, a party. Um, he kind of doesn't really want to have the party, but, um, and his wife, um, again, played by a great, I think that's, I think that's Ida Galley. You'll recognize her as well. She is kind of cool. She's played a lot of secondary roles, um, in the past, and this is definitely one of her biggest roles as far as being featured. I think she shows her acting prowess in this film, which is one of, I think it's cool, it's coolest elements. In a big Italian vi villa, looks great, of course. They always use the locations to my opinion, to the best, to the fullest. You go up, you see the basements and the crypts and the different rooms and all that stuff. That's like that with this film. You get to see everything. There's, again, an amazing scene, set piece, where all the guests to this party, what do you want to call it, um, they kind of wander up to this. It's kind of like an attic, really. But it's, of course, a grand architecture, you know, ornate. Everything's amazing. Um, it's, of course, there's a storm outside, so you have the, the lightning coming through the window, and it's this beautiful room kind of a blue tint to it and there's all these mannequins with um with uh, various clothing on them and it's just a great set piece i love mannequins in films um great set piece they're all kind of wandering around you got the lightning it's a gorgeous looking scene it's creepy um i could have watched that scene alone for two and a half hours then just walking around this amazing attic um but that's the thing with these films they have these memorable moments, memorable scenes, and a lot of these films I'm talking about tonight have these, those elements, and that one's definitely a memorable one. Great final act, um, couple twists, you're kind of wondering who's, you know, they're playing on one of those we see it many times, not just town horror, but horror in general. The woman, she's got some mental um, illness issues, is she crazy, is she imagining this, is she the killer, it's one of those things, a traumatic experience um, earlier early on in her life, which actually is how the film starts, which is really well done. Kind of a slasher setup in that way. Um, amazing film, Spirits of Death. Never hear anyone talk about this film. Awesome. Love it so much. So cool to be back with you guys. I miss you all very much. Talking Italian horror like the old days. Cross the River. This is the, the modern film that I was speaking of earlier. This was nominated for Best Picture my, on the Hornies that year. I forget which year it was. Several years back. So great. Creepy atmospheric film about a, a photographer, a researcher, um, who's conducting like a land study or something. And he ends up getting stuck because of a storm. He's a stuck on the other side of the river. And he's stuck there. And he basically kind of starts losing his mind. And he ends up in this, because um, it's basically a flood. And he ends up in this, like, abandoned, it's almost like a, a an abandoned, like, small village. And again, this is where those amazing locations, all, authentic locations, always seem to come into play with Italian horror. 
which adds so much to the overall atmosphere. And most of the film takes place at night in the rain, so it's, it's dark, cloudy, um, you know, rain soaked and fog and, and just, it's, it's just, a, that most of it's at night, so it just has that automatic atmosphere and he's inside and he ends up seeing um, these young girls and there's of course a legend to where he's stuck at in the woods where something took place and there's like these ghosts. So it's, it kind of hits on, you don't often see um, within the town some um, town horror paranormal ghost stuff is probably one of their least um, traveled subgenres from a Italian perspective. Uh, they didn't they didn't really get in, involved with uh, supernatural stuff very often here and there, but generally speaking, you, you would think there would be more Italian ghost films. Um, again, there was some, especially back in some of the gothic ones, but this was a modern take on it, done really well. There's def there's one particular scene with uh, like white sheets, which is really creepy. Um, Awesome film by uh, Lorenzo Bianchini. I don't think he's made anything since then, unfortunately. He has made a couple other films that are definitely worth checking out. I hope he makes another film. Awesome, atmospheric, rain-drenched. I, I like to watch this in the fall and autumn. It has that kind of autumn feel to it. Um, creepy, atmospheric, um, plotting, narrative. But uh, across the river, again, don't hear too many people talk about this. They're talking about modern Italian horror. This is... I said it before when I post about this film, I think this is the best Italian horror film since uh, Soavi's Cemetery Man. I think the third Christopher Lee one here, which is crazy because you think, again, with his, his credentials that all his films would be have great releases. But uh, again, this is, I didn't realize this, this is retro media once again coming through these labels that don't get a lot of talk. But here's another um, criminally underrated film. Crypt of the Vampire. This is black and white. This is one of my favorite vampire films. Um, and it, it, it's one of those films that um, it's the Karnstein um, mythology, which um, has been touched upon by many, especially in, in European horror. Um, it's probably a name that, that you recognize in the Carmela um, story, which is an old story um, of vampires and has been done very well. Uh, Blood and Roses, um, probably the best, in my opinion. Uh, Carmelo adaptation, the great French film from the 60s. Um, talk about a film that needs a great release. Anyway, so it's, it's an ad adaptation of that. So you have a female vampire here, and um, she does really well. She's been in a few other films too. Um, I don't know her name, but she was in most notably, it was a Spanish um, vampire film. The name's going to escape me. It has Anita Ekberg in it, I believe. And I can't think of the name for life right now. I love the film. Um, Malenka is the the one title has another title. Anyway, she's she's in that film as well. Gorgeous. Again, I'm bringing up individual scenes that hopefully will get you to inspire you to uh, seek the film out. Great scene with her. She's kind of she's definitely one of those um, tortured leads, and she she knows she's beginning to learn her fate, and she of course is apprehensive towards that and uh, the the weight of it, you know. And uh, there's a scene where she's kind of like tied up, and she's clearly nude. They don't show everything. But it's a pretty, you know, extreme scene for its time. Almost reminds you of something that would be in a, one of the old, great black and white uh, Jess Franco films, where it's kind of like it's definitely pushing those boundar boundaries for the time sexually. Um, great scene though, love it so much. Um, again, another period piece, gothic um, horror film in this case. Um, vampires, great, definitely one of my all-time favorite vampire films. Um, again. A lot of these films, I watch these quite regularly, um, and this is definitely one of those just black and white gothic, atmospheric, Italian horror. Absolutely love it. Somebody, please, release this Blu-ray. Give it a great cover art. As you can see, that cover art sucks. Oh, Rose. Can I call you that? Oh, Rose. Rose of a... You're so great. <laughs> Devil's Wedding, I guess, with the gorgeous roles of Neri. Uh, she's a she's an actress that I think she certainly had um, her starring roles, but I think generally speaking, um, much like the the actress I mentioned earlier, generally speaking, she's like a secondary character. And this is great. I love this film so much because she really is the star of this, along with Mark Damon, who I love, who's been in a bunch of great European um, um, gothic horror films. 
he, again, here's a guy who relishes in the role, in my opinion, in this place. He, he, take, he plays a double role of uh, twin brothers, and he's basically going to... He's going to try to find this relic. He's like a collector and uh, does research and, and um, gemstones and stuff like that. So it starts off with him like in this almost like a library with a big book, and he's and his brother comes in. and He kind of says he's having money problems, and, and Mark Damon's like, "Well, I'm going I'm going to Transylvania to try to find this this um, crazy artifact, this ring, which you know." Long story short, we know, we, know, we know where that goes. So he goes to Transylvania, ends up at a castle, of course, and um, which uh, is occupied by the lovely Rosa Bonieri, who plays, it's never really said, but she, it's insinuating, you can pick up that she's basically playing the role of um, Countess Elizabeth Bathory. I think they just uh, refer to her as the Countess. So they don't actually explicitly say Bathory, but um, love that character of, of of literature and the past of history of Elizabeth Bathory and it's awesome when it's when it's um touched upon in a horror film and this is I think one of the best Elizabeth Bathory themed horror films rolls about is, is perfect for the role um and she just really shows again she shows her acting chops in this film it's, it has a lot of great psychedelic scenes where uh Matt Damon is, is in the castle and they, they give him some wine which of course is is um laced with something you get so there's a couple like really cool effects with with uh like color filters and he's kind of um just some really cool hypnotic psych psychedelic shots there's a great scene where there's a love scene with with rolls about and which of course is great in and of itself of course but it's done really well i actually a lot of times i see like love scenes in films kind of awkward this one was actually pretty erotic and then it ends in a great horror way where he looks up and suddenly she turns into a bat and when he look, opens his eyes there's just a close-up, a great close-up of a bat's face of course making a, a snarling noise and it's, it's actually really surprising actually super cool and well done um, I like when you actually see like real bats in, um, in vampire films and this one it's this particular scene is done really well another incredibly memorable scene one of my favorites from a strictly eye candy perspective and uh, talk about talk about nailing the Elizabeth Bathory um, imagery so perfectly is when Rosabud basically has this, it's of course pretty damn hot too of course um, they're her um, her hostess or whatever um, the maid or whatever you want to call the character that lives there with her she's pouring blood on her nude body and she's in like this big tub which of course is part of Elizabeth Bathory insinuated that she's bathing in the uh, virgin's blood and she's completely covered with blood. She stands up, and the shot is so well lit behind her. And fog, lots of fog starts coming up behind her. She stands up, blood all over her. Amazing looking scene. Um, makes me stand up and just applaud. Incredible looking scene. So perfectly lit and executed. Um, great final act. Um, such a such a cool, fun, atmospheric, um, bloody vampire film love it so much again this is one of my favorite vampire films i have many of them of course but this is definitely one of my favorites i love when they, i think i think the italians did vampire films very well don't get a lot of credit for that um another great scene is when she calls rosebud standing on top of the castle she has this ring that i mentioned earlier and she just holds it up even her stance is just badass and then all of a sudden all these women start coming to the castle and of course they're they're in white nightgowns um and they just start walking through the woods into the castle. Of course, it's well lit behind them, behind their nightgowns. Um, you know, they're walking, fog around them. Amazing scene. Scenes like that have been done before. Of course, I love them all the time. Scenes like that, and uh, it's just it's just so well done. And uh, again, a, a vampire film with tons of atmosphere and lots of memorable individual scenes. And again, Mark Damon is great in a dual role. Franco Nero again, great hard box release of this film, A Quiet Place in the Country, a film I don't hear gets talked about enough, kind of a quasi giallo, um, but it, it, it's one of those, I think a great um, great story to, to dig into when it comes to telling a horror story is the, you know, the tortured writer, the tortured artist, uh, being an artist myself, I can relate to that, and then, I mean, I had my doctor straight up tell me, 
you know, I deal with, I think it's personal here, but I deal with anxiety, clinical anxiety, and I remember an early talk with my doctor, and he said, listen, you know, I know you're in a band, you write, generally speaking, artists are pretty much head cases very, quite often, so I think I can definitely relate to some of these films like this, where they're, where they're showing the tortured artist and the kind of the psychosis of that. And uh, Frank O'Neill is so great with this, but I also really, to me, um, who actually steals a show from him, which is, of course, very difficult to do, and uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm going to forget her name now, Vanessa Redgrave. Um, Jesus. Yes, sorry, Vanessa Redgrave. Um, I had to double check because honestly, she's not, a, I mean, she's obviously a very accomplished actress, well known. I don't know if she's ever won an Academy Award or anything. I'm really kind of ignorant when it comes to that. But um, I wasn't a fan of her at all until I saw this film. She, of course, was great in uh, The Devils, um, Ken Russell's film. She was, of course, great as a nun in that film. But she was never really on my radar as an actress um, until this film. She's great. She's the love interest of Frank O'Neill. She puts up, she's also his publicist, I believe, and she, uh, agent, whatever you want to say. And she, um, he's a writer, so they go to this, this, quiet place in the country to try to, you know, one of those classic setups of where he needs to just relax a little bit, um, free his mind, be in a good environment in the country, um, and be able to write a successful book again. She does all she can to help him. Um, and she's really cool. She just her fashion, very fashion forward. Um, she's just so awesome in this film. Very likable, I think, because he definitely at times treats her like shit. Um, and I actually found her like really sexy in this film, which I normally don't, again. For, so for Nessa Redgrave to me um, really steals the show in this film um, but great great Frank O'Neill does great of course and uh, actually um, I'm going to forget this actress's name too who I really love who's been in a lot of um, oh my god I'm going to forget her name anyway it's an early role from her maybe I'll add her name in the editing um, it's an early role for that actress it's cool seeing her um, that great atmosphere and within the country most of it actually takes place during the day in the sun, um, which adds a whole cool different kind of creative element to it. Again, it's all about the mind of Frank O'Neill, his psychosis, and um, he realizes something bad happened at this 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 home, this villa, which of course adds to the that element to his psychological uh, problems that he's going through. Super cool, very artistic, very artsy film. It has a great opening. It's great opening artistic um, credits credit sequence, which I absolutely love. So definitely art, him being a writer and a painter. Um, you know, there's a, a scene where he's just throwing paint all over this huge um, um, canvas, and it's just, I don't know, it's just awesome. So you have paint, you have a villa, you have Vanessa Radgrave. Um, super cool film, I love it so much. And I, I have to say, an awesome score. I don't know who did it, but definitely a score I need on vinyl. It's very, a lot of, like, um, Lots of str vibrant strings, noises, um, like out of tune instruments. That's a very uh, frenetic type score. Awesome. Last couple guys, and this one's definitely, I mean, I would put this as one of my favorite Italian horror films ever. And if definitely one of my favorite uh, final acts of any Italian horror film. Um, the Killer Reserve Nine Seats. Definitely Giallo, but there's... I don't want to give things away. But it's a Giallo, but definitely has some... I talk about the, the ghost elements that don't get touched upon, at least often to me in Italian horror. Um, some really cool supernatural elements to this film. I'll leave it at that, because the final act is, is, is a big part of this film. But it takes place in a theater, again, the, those, those authentic locations. And I have to think that this film, um, with it being an Italian film, influenced Mikhail, Mikhail Soavi's fantastic um, debut, Stage Fright. Not so much, definitely not in the story, but in the fact of its location where the whole film essentially takes place in a theater. And there is some killing involved. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if he was definitely influenced by this film. Um, but I mentioned this earlier, how in these locations, it's not like a situation where we just see maybe one room or one set piece they use these locations as they should if you had access to these use all of it and this place uses the this film uses the entire theater you see the stage behind the stage backstage um the offices much like so obviously stage fright um, um 
they don't go under the stage like stage fright did, but you see all the the um the balconies and the, 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 the luxury box seats. I mean you see the whole theater, the basement, um, and they use it to its advantage, to its fullest, and the kills are stylish. Um, you have a group of, of friends, um, it's one of those things, a group of affluent friends, um, end up, they have like a party or they went out one night and they end up at this theater, and then they start to question like, how did they end up there? And then the killer's on the loose and then they can't get out of the theater. They start, of course, questioning each other. So all that, like, personal drama comes out, which of course we've seen before in setups. Um, there's love interests, of course, there's love triangle, all that stuff, but it doesn't really focus on Sometimes some of those films focus too much on the relationships and it gets kind of bogged down and kind of soap opera-like. This, while it touches on that, still the focus of the film is the the actual terror and the killings and them trying to survive. Great cast. Um, yeah, just just using that, that's the memorable thing to me is the location. And then there's a couple, I won't give anything away, there's a couple surprise um, elements to the location that are revealed later on in the film that that lends to where I call it one of my favorite final acts. And if you've never seen this, I will, I'll leave it at that. I would say definitely, again, I love all these films. Get all these, see all these. Um, this was definitely, I guess, I, have, I only have one more here, and I guess I just subconsciously maybe left my two favorites for last. Um, what a great film. This is a great release. This is a Blu-ray, too. This is one of the upgrades from um, Camera Obscura. So looks beautiful. What a great film. Great artwork too. And this scene, for the record, is in the film. And lastly, guys, this is it. The final film of my underrated, overlooked Italian, the, uh, the much-delayed sequel. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I certainly have. This is the final film here in my pile. This is The Murder Clinic. Definitely not a great title, especially when... Um, I don't know, it doesn't fit it too well. Clinic in that it takes place in a you know, hospital clinic, but it's more of a, um, not the hospital in the sense of what doctors running around performing surgeries and that stuff. It's more so um, housing them while they get better, that, that type of clinic per se. But ultimately, though, it, it's essentially a castle, a mansion. Um, and so you have a doctor who is doing experiments on people. But... That's not really the focus. It's not. It's not a mad scientist film. It's it's revealing what happened. Basically, one of those situations we've seen again. This in God the Corlot, where he has a secret with his his um his wife. Basically, one of those situations where a beautiful woman ends up getting in an accident and her beauty is scarred. Which again, I love this angle of stories and horror. Where and then the man feels guilty and wants to help get his wife's beauty back. So it's one of those films. And it's revealed as time goes on what happened to his wife. There's some great makeup. I don't know if you can see that. Oh, that's blurry. Um, the makeup on his 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 wife is great. Um, definitely gothic fueled um, in this mansion. Again, the ornate architecture lends everything well. Candles. Um, it just. I mean, I just obviously I just eat that stuff up, and I love it. So if you're in a lot of these. There seems definitely seems to be a very big gothic theme to a lot of these films, a majority of them at least. So if you really crave that like I do, um, then this is another great one. You have torches and candles, and um, and there are, you know, there's someone going around killing. There's a fantastic scene early on. I got I have to mention the cinematography is definitely notable in this film. Um, and this is unfortunately was the only horror film done by this uh, director. Um, and he made a lot, I looked him up on um, IMDb, he did a lot of films and TV and stuff, but this is his only horror film, which is a damn shame. This stars, stars William Berger, by the way. Um, well, there's a great scene early on in the film, which kind of sets the tone artistically, where a, a beautiful woman walks, is leaving the, the mansion, the clinic, whatever, and she's, um, she's being followed, she knows someone's after her, and she's you know, walking fast, and you pass, of course, like the trees, like I mentioned, with the Virgin of Nuremberg, and this great shot where she ends up on this perfectly lit, it's at night, fountain in the middle of trees. And she basically gets killed and ends up, like, resting. It's not a, it's not a very bloody film at all, really. Um, the, the kills are more style as opposed to, you know, gory. But they're just very done very well and look very stylish, which is great. I'll take that anything. 
always love the gore, but I'll take this style as well. And she ends up just laying over the fountain, and there's a perfectly like centered shot. That's the type of film that says it just looks great. Um, great atmosphere. And the Murder Clinic, this is a German release. This is also a, this is a Blu-ray too, so, you know, I know a lot of people are against DVDs, but, so, this is a Blu-ray, looks fantastic. Um, these definitely are on eBay quite often. I see them on there. So, uh, yeah, hope you enjoyed this. 13 great films to me. I absolutely adore them. I hope I convey that to you guys um, as I stumble over my words and my adjectives, as I usually do, and I ramble, which I always do. So, Charles, everybody, again, I miss you all. Please check out my podcast. Let me know your thoughts. Um, and please... Join me for the 10th Hornies. I can't believe it, guys. I'm really proud of that. I really am. I definitely didn't think when I started um, the Hornies 10 years ago and carrying that modern horror flag um, that 10 years later I'd still be doing and that, that you're still watching, so I appreciate that. And, again, like like I always say, a lot of films I from this year that I haven't seen other people talk about, some that I have, um, and it's been, it, despite everything, it's, it's been another great year, and I can't wait to talk about it and doing it in a little bit more of a different setting live and hopefully we, we can interact with you Vinci and I and um, Saturday January 2nd 8 o'clock Eastern join us if you don't if you can't definitely check it on the, the replay you can check it later on YouTube um, cheers guys cheers I'm not saying cheers for it this was all out of just rusty I guess guys cheers and uh Stay scared, stay safe, wear a fucking mask, please. And uh, we'll see you guys at the Hornies, 10th Annual Hornies. Let me know your thoughts on these films. Have you seen them all? Have you seen any of them? Have you seen some of them? Charge guys, Italian horror. It's the best. See you later.